If you have ever wondered if we can still build the beautiful buildings and neighborhoods you see in historical city centers, you are not alone. Many start to long for these types of environments, especially when they are driving through endless car-oriented suburbs or facing the bland, generic architecture of many of today's cities. What you might have seen on a holiday in Florence or Amsterdam or in some older parts of Boston looks much more enjoyable and beautiful. Maybe you think we could build like that again, but can we? And perhaps more importantly, should we? The types of architecture and urbanism I'm talking about are called traditional architecture and traditional urbanism. But what is that? And why is it even relevant in our modern society? In this video, I'll give a fresh perspective on what tradition really is when talking about architecture and urbanism. We'll continue with a story of what happened when the world turned to a new way of building called modernism and what problems came up as a result of that. Finally, I'll shine a light on the main question of this video. Can we still build like we used to? And should we? Because our cities today face many crises of sustainability, of livability and health, and of course of beauty and meaning. If you want to create more beautiful, livable cities, we need to do things differently. And for that, we better use all the tools we have at our disposal. So without further ado, let's discover if building like we used to can help solve these challenges. As I told in the intro, the type of architecture we see in historical cities can be defined as traditional architecture. These buildings are often lined up side by side in streets, often in medium to high density urban environments. This urban fabric can be called traditional urban fabric, and the practice of creating these environments can be called traditional urbanism. But tradition, you might think, isn't that old fashioned like folk dance, traditional clothing and outdated customs? Isn't tradition doing things like they have always been done, making it an enemy to progress? Well, no, there is much more to it than you'd think. There is a reason why we categorize these buildings and areas as traditional, and that has everything to do with how modernism changed the way we built in the course of the 20th century. But before I tell more about that, we need to see what tradition really is, and perhaps we'll discover it is different than you imagined. Traditional building, what is it? To explain this, let's imagine two tribes. One lives in a temperate climate, near a river and a forest, and one lives in an arid area. The tribe living in the temperate climate builds using wood they find in the forest, sand and clay from the river and straw from the river banks. Their roofs are steep against the rain and their windows are bigger to let more light in. But the tribe in the arid area builds differently because they have to deal with the scorching hot sun. They paint their houses white, have flat roofs because it almost never rains and have small windows to keep the heat out. Everything these tribes do is for a reason. They figure out what works and keep those solutions and whatever doesn't work they stop doing. After all, they don't have endless resources. This is basically how building traditions work. They are not about some nostalgic attachment to the past, but they are processes of using proven techniques, materials and ideas while also testing out and implementing new ones. And all of this is continually adapted to local climate, materials and cultural practices. Imagine this process occurring on a worldwide scale for thousands of years, resulting in a tapestry of different building traditions that have ingeniously adapted to various environments. People across the globe have discovered efficient ways to build, keep warm in winter, stay cool in summer and have refined these solutions to make them beautiful as well. The Dutch architect Mieke Bosse of Scala Architects summarizes this beautifully. Tradition is the sum of successful innovations. What are common design principles across various building traditions? They are context sensitive, they take human proportions into account and make use of local materials, which reduces the environmental impact of buildings. Craftsmanship, often passed down through generations, is employed and symmetry, proportions, subdivision and ornamentation contribute to a pleasing, balanced and beautiful appearance. And what about tradition in urbanism? Well, we must again look at the circumstances in which cities were built in those days. People didn't have access to cars, and not everyone could afford to have, for example, a horse-drawn carriage. Therefore, cities were constrained in size. Everything was more or less at walking distance. Even in the 19th century, when cities started to expand rapidly, development often occurred around train stations or streetcar stations. But walking was still one of the major ways of getting around. These circumstances created compact cities, even during the industrial age. The compact cities allowed for many local businesses and close-knit communities to thrive. You would meet your neighbors on the street during your walk to work or to the closest train, streetcar or metro station. 
you'd get your newspaper along the way and some groceries on your way back. Children would play in the street under the watchful eye of a network of neighbors and shopkeepers. This led to incredibly safe, high trust living environments. Jane Jacobs described this beautifully in her book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. So that is how buildings and cities used to be built. Proven principles were used. Innovations were tested and implemented if they had merit. And cities were built to adapt to local circumstances, but always taking human skill into account. But things would soon change. In the early 20th century, the world was going through a rapid transition. The Industrial Revolution had already transformed society, and now even more radical new technologies, like the car, were introduced. A world war was fought and led to many societal changes. And finally, abstract painting and sculpture transformed the world of art. All these influences and more, I can only do so much in this video, gave rise to a totally new school of architecture. It is what we today know as modernism. Reinforced concrete, glass and steel offered exciting new opportunities for buildings. Suddenly it was possible to take away the external wall as a supporting structure, to create huge floor spans and open up the facade in ways that were impossible up to that point. Architects like Le Corbusier, a Swiss, and architects connected to the Bauhaus Architecture School in Germany, developed a set of new ideas for architecture. Their ideas were also a reaction to the clutteredness of the 19th century and a revival of old styles which they thought stifled innovation and the potential for individual expression. Values like purity and honesty of the design were very important to the early modernists, which meant that they rejected any form of ornament. They also made full use of the materials I just mentioned. But just offering an alternative to the traditional way of building was not enough. The modernists even wanted to go one step further. All traditional building techniques and styles were branded as outdated and had to be replaced. This was a view that became more accepted and stronger after the Second World War. No matter the rich history or local cultural preferences, the world was moving on and had to subscribe to this way of building. Architecture had split up, with modernism on the one hand and all that came before, or traditional architecture, on the other. The same happened in planning, with the SIAM Congresses, or Congrès International d'Architecture Moderne, which delivered a document called the Charter of Athens which introduced concepts like the tower in the park, bringing light, air and space in cities, and the separation of living, working and recreation as separate functions. The modernist principles had a huge influence on how cities and buildings were built from that point on. If you want to learn more about the development and impact of modernism, the book Making Dystopia by Professor James Stevens Girl is an excellent reading choice, but there are many other works to read on this of course. So the next question becomes, did the modernist buildings and areas function as planned and were they a real improvement? Well, some functioned fine, but many also didn't. But before I move on to tell more about this, if you like this video, please press the like button and subscribe to this channel. It really helps in getting more awareness for potential solutions that can help our cities. So let's move on to the problem with modernist architecture and urbanism. So what are these problems exactly? I will keep this topic a bit short because I could and probably will make an entire video about it. In short, what happened was that traditional architecture and urbanism, including the solutions which had been developed and refined over thousands of years, were replaced with modernist architecture and modernist planning. Here we had some ideas that were brand new and untested. Although these new ideas led to some true masterpieces, the majority of these new buildings were not that special. Sometimes they were even boring or depressing. Their minimalist surfaces were not designed to age with grace, as they lacked cornices, and often got smeared in the rain. This still happens by the way. The buildings also lacked the biophilic qualities I mentioned in my video What Makes Buildings Beautiful. Although the early modernist designs were all about honesty and rationality of the design, nowadays modern designs seem to shout for attention, but mostly modernist buildings don't seem to be designed to harmonize with the buildings around them, leading to cluttered and chaotic cityscapes. This has all led to modernist architecture not being very popular with a very big part of the population. Modernist urban planning also had its problems. The separation of functions like living, working and recreation in cities created dull, sometimes even hostile living environments that were car dependent, more favorable to big centralized malls with chain stores instead of independent shops and lacked any sense of context. It was the human dimension in these areas that was overlooked the way humans naturally interact, their inherent needs. Modernist cities were designed for rational agents that acted efficiently and logically, but humans are often far from rational 
or optimally efficient. We're not robots after all. Things like serendipity or chance meetings are an essential part of city life. It's things like that that make cities exciting and fun to live in. So if modernist architecture and urbanism doesn't work that well, is there an alternative? Well, there seems to be one, and that is to build new traditional architecture and urbanism. But what do we mean by that? There is someone who can explain this better than I, Michael Diamants, an expert from Sweden who has been carefully studying traditional architecture for over 10 years. New traditional architecture is not a style. That is very important to stress. What is new traditional architecture then? New traditional architecture is the framework and architecture philosophy that guides us how to design a building. This framework is different in different parts of the world because over the world you have different building traditions, but basically it tells us how we should divide our facades, what proportions we should use and what scale we should use when applying this. And each tradition also has specific style elements. That is what new traditional architecture is. So that is what we mean by new traditional architecture. We don't want overly decorated, fake or wonky buildings, ironic variations on historical themes, or one-on-one -on -one copies. We want serious, high-quality buildings that apply the time-tested principles we discussed, that people can connect with, using local materials if possible. And of course, that doesn't exclude the use of modern techniques or materials. Those only need to be integrated well. What about traditional urbanism? This means we start building dense, mixed-use and attractive places again, that offer a sense of local identity, that are walkable and cycle-friendly with streets and squares, parks and boulevards. It means building places we recognize as cities and mimic the qualities of places we love. So this all sounds mighty interesting and nice to have, but let's be realistic. Can we still build like we used to? Well, apparently we can, because we have. I have visited places like Paanbury near Dorchester, Le Plessis Robinson in France, St. Eric's Omeradet in Stockholm, Brandevoort in Holland, Kajala in Guatemala and Heulebrug in Belgium to see the proof that it can still be done with my own two eyes. Despite their differences in craftsmanship, all these places still reflect their culture and have a clear local identity. Additionally, projects like Building Culture from Oklahoma prove that building with traditional techniques like load-bearing masonry walls is still possible and it captures the imagination of many. Despite all this, there are people who argue against the use of traditional building styles or techniques. Covering these arguments fully in this video would make it far too long, but most of these arguments are based on assumptions, are straight up fallacies, or have other serious flaws. So I will leave this complete debunking to a future video. There's one valid criticism though, and that is that great craftsmanship is not as ubiquitous as it used to be. According to Alejandro Garcia Hermida, an expert in traditional building methods and materials, there is hope. There are still many extremely skilled craftsmen who can make almost anything you see in traditional and classical buildings. But due to modern construction methods and building regulations, combined with uninspired and unambitious developers that favor a quick profit over long-term value, a lot of craftsmanship was lost. Rebuilding this skill set is not impossible, but there will need to be changes in education, the number of architects using traditional methods needs to rise, and careers in craftsmanship need to get the praise and prestige they deserve. Even small increases in application of craftsmanship can have a ripple effect and snowball into something greater. This way, the oil tanker that is the construction industry can be slowly turned around. So, what should happen now? We should start taking traditional architecture and urbanism as serious as we do modernism for new construction. We need to honestly look at the merits of these principles, because they have already been used to create massively popular and successful places. We have some serious crises on our hands, and fixing those requires that we use all the tools, especially those that have been time proven, and not only novel ones, because that's one of the weird things of today. There is a sort of stigma against using proven traditional solutions. In architecture, innovation and originality are valued above what has been done. And this has led to a lot of buildings trying to be unique, but failing at being beautiful. It's as if we're at the side of the road with a broken car, which we need to repair. But there's someone dictating which tools we should and shouldn't use, which is absurd and unhelpful. Finally, the building traditions are also a treasure room of artful forms, stories and meaning that we could take inspiration from. They are there for the taking, 
and are inviting us to be reused to bring joy, warmth and beauty to our cities. Not to use them would be a shame. It's like being offered the richest buffet in the world with flavors from all continents, but only putting pork chops on your plate. Let's embrace solutions that work. Let's enjoy the whole buffet of traditions and let's not be ashamed about it, but thankful and excited. It is possible. Share this video with whomever needs to see it, because nobody is going to do it for us, so we better do it ourselves. Before you go, check out the last video I made about a town that did the impossible and embraced the principles I talked about in this video. I'm sure you'll find it interesting. So there you have it. Comment on what you think and please help the discussion about this topic by sharing it. If you like this content, please help by liking and subscribing. If you really want to support this channel, become a patron or join us on Discord. Thank you for watching until next time.